Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 7Q, where we're going to extend our discussion of relatedness to a deeper consideration of ancestry farther back in time. We'll think about what happens to the segments of DNA that we inherit from our ancestors. To what extent are they lost by chance or degraded by mutation? And we'll think about the implications of this for genetic diversity, which is the fundamental raw material needed by natural selection. So here's a family tree drawing. It's the same drawing that you saw in Module 6. But now that we understand more about how inheritance works, I want to use it to think about what happens to the DNA segments that we inherit from our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and farther back. And to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider, so we've gone five generations back. These are great, great, great grandparents, great, great, great grandparents. We have 32 of them. And what I've done is I've assigned each of them a different color to, so we can think about the segments of genome that we might have inherited from each of these ancestors. So there's two sort of extremes of outcome. One possibility is that we've still got from our 32 great, great, great grandparents that we've got segments of DNA from all of them in all our chromosomes. They'd be quite short segments because we've got 32, but chromosomes are pretty big, so they'd still be millions of base pairs long. The alternative is that the segments are much bigger, but we only have segments from a subset of our ancestors. And the rest of them were just unlucky, and their segments didn't get passed on to us. In fact, it's this second option that's what actually happens. We have, in our genome, we have segments from some of our ancestors, but for many of our ancestors, we don't have segments at all. Another way to describe it is that all of these people, all of these great, great, great grandparents are true genealogical ancestors. They are the parents of the parents of the parents of your parents. They're real ancestors, but they're genealogical ancestors only. They're not, many of them are not genetic ancestors in that you no longer have in your genome any pieces of DNA that were inherited from them. So most of these haplotype segments get lost because of chance events in meiosis and mating. You remember when we looked at the comparisons between the grandchild and the grandparent and the great-grandparent, we could easily find examples where whole chromosomes had not been passed on from the grandparent to the child. That was just one chromosome, but over more generations, more and more chromosomes would just by chance not be included in the gamete that became the next generation. The segments that do get passed on will gradually get shorter as other segments are lost, but they are replaced by new segments from other relatives. And this graph is an analysis of how quickly the segments are predicted to get shorter. And what you notice is that the chromosomal segments that we inherit from in the first few generations get shorter very quickly. So by the first you know, four or five generations, the segments are only about a tenth as long as a whole chromosome. But then the rate at which the segments get shorter slows down dramatically, so that by the time 100 generations have passed, very, very little is happening to those segments. And that's because once a segment gets very short, for instance, this little segment here, they're so short that they're very rarely interrupted by a crossover. So they become quite stable just by virtue of being sort of um, unimpressive, by being inconspicuous. Um, for example, a segment that's only 100, um, this, that's this long, less than a megabase long, is going to get disrupted by a crossover less than once in every 100 generations. So that makes them very stable. Now, 
we can think about it another way and ask how quickly are ancestral segments lost for, from our genome, focusing on the segments that are lost. This is an analysis by Dr. Graham Coop of the probability of not inheriting any segments from a ancestor as you go back in time. So for parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, the odds are that at least one of our chromosomes is still going to have segments of their DNA. But by the time you get back to seven, eight, nine, and ten generations back, the odds of not having any representation anywhere in the genome gets much, much higher. By the time we get back to about 15 generations, almost all of our ancestors at that time are not represented in our genome. Um, we can do another calculation. Um, this is for about 20 years ago, 20 generations ago, which would be about 500 years ago. At that time, if we do look at genealogical ancestors, we would have had about a million genealogical ancestors. But we've only got a few thousand genomic segments in our whole genome. So that tells us more than 99% of these ancestors didn't make it to become genetic ancestors. Now this has implications for genome-wide association studies. What's being detected in these studies is ancient linkages between the SNP loci that the genome typing detects and the locus at which the genetic difference is affecting the genotype. Remember that in most cases, the genetic differences that are detected by the SNP typing are not the differences that are responsible for the differences in phenotype. They're just described as being associated because they are close together. So another word that we could use for association is linkage. The SNP locus and the phenotype locus that it's associated with are very closely linked in the genome. These are places where the SNP and the phenotype locus are so close together that they're very rarely disrupted by recombination. And individuals either inherit both the A, for instance, the A allele of the SNP locus and the high-risk allele at the phenotype locus, or they inherit the T allele at the SNP locus and the low-risk allele at the genotype locus. These, um, mar these positions are so close together that over a very long time they've very rarely been disrupted by recombination. That's why genome-wide association studies detect closely linked markers. They don't expand over long regions of the chromosome because those linkages have been disrupted by crossovers. Now, there's two exceptions to this story that I've told you about segments being lost. And they're the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome DNA that have been traditionally used for ancestry studies. And that's because both of these markers are inherited intact through a specific lineage. So the mitochondrial DNA is it passed down directly from mother to daughter without being broken up by recombination. At the same time, the Y chromosome, so this is mitochondrial DNA, at the same time, the Y chromosome DNA is passed down intact from father to father, son to son to son. So these markers behave very differently in um, inheritance, in ancestry, then do the chromosomal, autosomal markers that we've discussed. When I talked about ancestry studies in Module 6, I emphasized that most of our genome is not inherited in this way. Almost all of the DNA that we have is autosomal DNA that comes from other parents. But now we realize that, in fact, even then, the coverage is very patchy. We have segments from some of these relatives and no segments from other of these relatives.
Now, one topic we didn't talk about is mutations. Should we be worrying about mutations accumulating and making the haplotype segments unrecognizable? Well, you can do the arithmetic for yourself and figure out whether this is likely in this question. So I'm telling you the, what the mutation rate is, how many generations to consider, and how big a chromosome segment. So now you have to do some arithmetic. And the answer is that there will be less than one mutation in this 100 KB segment, 100,000 base pairs of DNA, over 400 generations. DNA polymerase is so accurate that this segment will have accumulated less than one mutation. Um, the arithmetic is 1 times 10 to the minus 8 per base pair per generation times 400 generations times 10 to the fifth base pairs. And we cancel out the generations, we cancel out the base pairs, we get a value of 0 0.4. That's not very much. In fact, that's less than one mutation in 100 KB um, far less than the levels of genetic diversity that are present in these ancestral segments. So these mutations are not going to in any way interfere with our ability to detect the ancestral haplotypes. Now, a word about genetic diversity. Um, we've talked about how, um, we haven't talked about in the context of genetic diversity, but you'll see that what we've talked about, talking about mutations in module two, and now about recombination, that genetic diversity arises over the generations by random mutation, but as we just calculated, it arises quite slowly. It shuffled quickly by sexual reproduction, except for segments that are very short, where linkage is very tight. This genetic diversity is then lost over the generations when individuals don't reproduce, because they're now a genetic dead end, and it's lost when random ancestral blocks of DNA are not passed on to descendants, which we've seen is very, very common. And the problem is worse when the population is small. And a particular area of concern in evolution and ecology is what are called genetic bottlenecks. These are times when what was a reasonably large population goes through a period where the population is very small. That's when the population is particularly vulnerable to losing genetic diversity. This is a major concern in conservation because many endangered populations come to have very small populations. And so even if the, the species is subsequently restored in numbers, it may have lost a lot of its genetic diversity because of the transient bottleneck that it went through when the population was small. Now, I'm going to end with a human example of a bottleneck. And this is a bottleneck that the ancestors of the um, Native Americans, what Canadians call the First Nations people, people who were in North and South America before the Europeans came, their ancestors went through a genetic bottleneck. You'll remember that um, North and South America were peopled by migration from Asia across the land bridge that existed uh, across what is now the Bering Strait. This is because sea levels were lower. We know that this migration happened in part because of analysis of mitochondrial DNA, as I showed you in Module 6. Now, this was a relatively small population that passed through. And one way we know that is that various forms of genetic diversity were lost. In particular, the ABOB allele, 
the allele that gives blood type B is not present in the native populations of North and South America. And that's thought to be because they went through a bottleneck, a small population, during that period of migration. So we consider the phenomenon by which most of the segments of DNA that we inherit from our ancestors are lost by chance events in meiosis. Most of our ancestors don't have the privilege of contributing to our genomes. Um, the segments that persist slowly get shorter by random recombination and very slowly accumulate random mutations. Now, most of the associations between SNPs and the phenotypes that we detect using genome-wide association studies are very old. They reflect um, events that happened many, many generations ago. And we talked a bit about genetic diversity, how it's being constantly lost and gained by genetic processes, but how losses are especially important when populations become small. Coming up next, we're going to talk about go back to thinking about meiosis, and we're going to talk about what the sex chromosomes do in meiosis. I hope to see you there.